the Lancashire Witches, Chapter 7, The Abbey Mill. For a while, the abbot remained shattered and stupefied by this terrible interview. At length, he arose and made his way. He scarce knew how to the oratory, but it was long before the tumult of his thoughts could be at all allayed, and he had only just regained something like composure when he was disturbed by hearing a slight sound in the adjoining chamber. A mortal chill came over him, for he thought he might be them die return. Presently, he distinguished a footstep seldomly approaching him, and almost hoped that the wizard would consummate his vengeance by taking his life. But he was quickly undeceived, for a hand was placed on his shoulder, and a friendly voice whispered in his ears, Come along with me, Lord Abbot, get up quick, quick. Thus addressed, the abbot raised his eyes, and beheld a rusty figure standing beside him, divested of his clouted shoes, and armed with a long bare wood I don't know you know me, Lord Abbot, cried first, a friend, the howling naps on Wiswall, yon a man Wiswall, your own birthplace abbot, dunna be per te say, a er to getten a straight clash you done winder, and you can't be down it, I a trice, and no long to covers, way be to river, so to to mill, but the abbot said not quick quick, Lord howling naps, venturing to look at abbot's sleeve, every minute's precious, dunna be per te bill cross, a miller is a low poor, convert as she would have been here, I said all men, if he could bought that cursed wizard nick them die, turned my hand again him, and drove to porky head, intended for himself into Hogbert's side. They clapped me I a dungeon, but he built mona to get me out, and a then swore to do what Hogbert would have done if he been living. So here I am, Lord Abbot, come to set your free, and now you're known all about it, your con at no more hesitation. Come time presses, and a me hurt or he got all my hearing us. I thank you, my good friend, from the bottom of my heart, to ride the abbot rising, but however strong may be the temptation of life and liberty which you hold out to me, I cannot yield to it. I pledge my word to the Earl of Derby to make no attempt to escape. Were the doors thrown open and the guard removed, I should remain where I am. What exclaimed Helen Nabs in the torn of bitter disappointment? Your women go now or pay by the mess of your shan airs now go back to evil empty handed. If you aren't sworn to stay here, and sworn to set you free, and I keep my oath. Willingly, your shan go weep, may Lord Abbot. Forbear to urge me further, my good pal. Rejoined Hoslu, I fully appreciate your devotion, and I only regret that you and Abel Croft have exposed yourself to so much peril on my account. All covert as be when I beheld his body on the bier. I had a sad feeling that he had died in my behalf. Covert meant to rescue your Lord Abbot, replied Hal, and indeed resisting. Nick them dykes attempt to arrest him, or the old devil he added, brandishing his knife fiercelessly. The warlock shall have three inches of cowed seal between his ribs. First time I come across him, peace, my son, returned the abbot, and forego your bloody desire. Leave the wrenchman to the chastisement of heaven, and now farewell all your kind efforts to induce me to fly or vain. You wanna go, cried Hal, and I'm scratching his head. I cannot, replied the abbot, come with me to the window, then pursued Hal, and tell he so he'll think I fail else willingly, replied the abbot, and with noiseless footsteps followed him across the chamber. The window was open, and outside it was reared a ladder. Your mother go down to you, sir, said Helen now, or else he'll not hear you. The abbot complied and partly descended the ladder. I see no one, he said. It needs dark, replied Helen now, who was close behind him. I will can be far off. Heist, I hear him. Go on. The abbot was now obliged to comply, though he did so with reluctance. Presently he found himself on the roof of a building which he knew to be connected with the mill by a covered passage running along the south bank of the Calder. Scarcely had he set forth there than Helen Nabs jumped after him and seizing the ladder cast it into the stream, thus rendering Pasaloo's return impossible. Now, Lord Abbot, he cried with a low exulting laugh, you wanna broken your word and I am keep mine. You're free again, your word. You are destroyed me by your mistaken zeal, cried Abbot reproachfully. Not of a sort, cried Hal, and save you from destruction this way. Way on Abbot's way and taking the apostle arm, he led him to a low parapet overlooking the only passage before the scribe half an hour before it had been bright moonlight, but as if to favour the fugitive, the heavens had become overcast as a big mist had arisen from the river. I will, I will cry, Helena, leaning over the parapet. Here replied a voice below, it's all, it is, 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 it is,
worldwide how and what kind of you are done with the same pride evil. Never you mind you turn how both held to have it down has no boy been to easy further and with the help of Alan Abs and Miller and further aided by some irregularities in the wall, he was soon safely landed near the entrance to the passage. Abel fell on his knees press the abbot's hand to his wrist. Our blessed lady prays you are free to cry. Then her son talking to her evil in us, how and abs, who by this time had reached the ground, and to his receival of some new remonstrance on the abbot's part. And third all the shoe of your neither be afraid of that how and far the miller. God, I'll say to no one of our chaps, I just want to be like I have to be out of LA. And I warrant me that when a sir get a while, will it be your country? With this, he marched along the passage, followed by the old who presently arrived at the door against which he had a ball being withdrawn, it was instantly open to the admin party, and after which he was pretty sure and sure. The answer to a call from the miller arrived at the end of the scene, by the light, by the wooden set, and all these passed through at the entry to the able to mount it and found himself in a large ball game by the roof, which was covered by a great heat and covered in the cobwebs, whitened by flowers, while the wall was strewn with empty sacks and seats. The person who held the light proved to be the miller's order, Dorothy, and blooming lights of the eighty, and at the other end of the game, but seated on a bench for her fire, with an infant on her knee, was the miller's wife. The latter instantly arose on beholding the abbot and placed him the child on the home bin, advanced towards him, and dropped on her knees. While her daughter imitated her example, the abbot extended his hand over them and pronounced a solemn benediction. Bring your child also to me, that I may bless him, he said when he concluded. Now my child, but I will fly to the moon's wire, taking the infant and bringing it in. It were brought to me, it is very by evil. I wish it were all on you, I'm sure, but it's a form of the earth. One of its schemes is for one step and over, and she is grateful for a while in the down. And as she thought, she pointed to the infant's face, which was disfigured as she had stated by a strange and natural disposition of the eyes, one of which was set much lower in the head than the other. Awakened from sleep, the child uttered a feeble cry and stretched out its tiny arms to Dorothy. You ought to pity it for its deformity. Poor little creature, rather than reproach it, mother, observed the young damsel. Mary came all to cry her mother sharply, getting fine feelings with your learning from good father and solid. Oh, yes, said for you wish the brat far enough to get it as no mother, suggested Dorothy kindly. And no great matter if it hasn't returned the miller's wife. Best stem dykes, no great loss. Is this best stem dykes child? cried Paslow. Recoiling, Lee exclaimed the miller's wife, and mistaking the cause of Haslow's emotion, as added triumphantly to his daughter, A told T wench at the Lord Abbot would be. Of my way of thinking, the child has got the witch's mark laying upon her. Look, Lord Abbot, look. Haslow edited her, not to murmur to himself, ever in my path or where I will, it is vain to struggle with my way. I will go back and surrender myself to the Earl Derby. Na na, you shall not be that far. I'll announce you with the miller once more beside him. Sit down, Lord. That's you need to fire and take a cup of wine to cheer your hand. Then we set out in the forest where I have to find your safe hiding place. And the only reward I never asked for is to service shall be that your form of marriage service for me and Dolly one of these things. And he nudged the damsel's elbow who turned away covered with rushes. The abbot moved mechanically to the fire and sat down while the miller's wife surrendered the child with a shrug of the shoulders and grimace to her daughter and went in to serve some viands and flask of wine which she set before Haslam the miller then filled the drinking horn and presented it to his guest who was about to raise it to his lips when a loud knocking was heard at the door below. The knocking continued with increased violence and voices were heard calling upon the miller to open the door or it would be broken down. On the first alarm Abel had walked to a small window when he was written to the doors below and now returned to the base white with terror to say that a party of archivistiers and the sheriff at their head were revowed and that some of the men were provided with torches. They have discovered my evasion and are come in search of me, observed the abbot, rising from without betraying any anxiety. Do not concern yourselves further with me, my friend, for open the door and deliver me to them. Nah, nah, that's the window, cried Helen you're now came yet further out and I know a way baffled. If you know let him down into the river, I will mind manage to get him off. Will for on now by the miller. Force now being made from seven years and no four knows the way of threat as we us only rotten about it, replied Helen. Go down to the grand room and follow I, I try. 
and I was able to snatch to the light and hastily descend the reception passively. How the sudden Dorothy's ears take care now, the one bond that she was dolly is a breaking I disable him. One day bond takes you to the church and place it near the altar when no ill comes to it or the near life may hang upon it. And as the poor girl who, as well as her mother, was almost riding out of her way from his compliance, hurried down the steps after the only muttering as the clamour without was visible. I roar onto your horse, you are gonna get in yet a while and promise me. Meanwhile, the abbot had even led to the chief room of the mill where all the corn formed lay consumed within the monastery had been fed, which the size of the chamber itself together with the vastness of the stone and the operation of and connecting to the huge water wheel outside proved to be by no means inconsiderable. Strong shafts of timber supported flooring above and were crossed by other boards placed horizontally, from which various implements in use at the mill depended, giving the chamber imperfectly lighted as it now was by the lamp borne by Abel. A strange and almost mysterious appearance, three or four of the miller's men, armed with pikes, had followed their master, and though much alarmed, they vowed to die rather than give up the abbot. By this time, Hal and Nabs had joined the group and proceeded towards a raised part of the chamber where the grinding stones were set. He knelt down and laying hold of a small ring, raised up the trapdoor. The fresh air, which blew up through the aperture, combined with the rushing sound of water, showed that the calder was immediately beneath, and having made some slight preparation, Hal let himself down into the stream. At this moment, a loud crash was heard, and one of the miller's men cried out that the arch viziers had burst open the door. He, Honde, then lads and let him down, cried Hal and Nabs, who had some difficulty in maintaining the footing on the rough stony bottom of the swift stream. Passive yielding, the abbot suffered the miller and one of the stoutest of his men to assist him through the trapdoor, while a third held down the lamp and showed Hal and Nabs to his middle in the dark and current, and stretching out his arms to receive the burden. The light fell upon the huge black circle of the water wheel, now sought upon the dripping arches for the mill. In another moment, the abbot plunged into the water, the trapdoor was placed and bolted underneath by Hal, while guiding his companion along and biding him catch hold of the woodwork of the wheel, heard a heavy trampling of many feet on the boards above, showing that the pursuers had obtained admittance. Encumbered by his heavy vestments, the abbot could with difficulty contend against the strong current, and he more mentally expected to be swept away, but he had a stout and active assistant by his side, who soon placed him under the shelter of the wheel. The trampling overhead continued for a few minutes, after which all was quiet, and Al judged that finding their search with him infectual, the enemy would speedily come forth, nor was he deceived. Shouts were soon heard at the door of the mill, and the glare of torches was cast on the stream. Then it was that Hal dragged his companion into a deep hole, formed by some decay in the masonry. Behind the wheel, where the water rose nearly to their chins, and where they were completely concealed, scarcely were they thus in scorns than two or three armed men holding torches aloft were seen wading under the archway, but after looking carefully around and even approaching close to the water wheel, these persons could detect nothing and withdrew, muttering curses of rage and disappointment. By and by, the lights almost wholly disappeared, and the shouts becoming fainter and more distant. It was evident that the men had gone lower down the river. Upon this, how thought they might venture to quit their retreat, and accordingly, grasping the abbot's arm, he proceeded to wade up the stream. Benumbered numbered with cold and half dead in terror, Paslu needed all his companions to so he could do little to help himself, added to which they occasionally encountered some large stone or set into a deep hole, so that it required how almost exertion and strength forced away. And at last they were out of the arch, and though both banks seemed unguarded, yet for fear of surprise, how did they prove it still to to the river? Their course was completely sheltered from observation by the mist that enveloped them, and after proceeding in this way for some distance, how sought to listen, and while debating with himself whether he should now quit the river, he fancied he beheld a black object swimming towards him, taking it for an otter, and which brushed his hand upon the calder. A stream swarming with trouts abounded, and knowing the creature did not meddle with them unless their attacks, he paid little attention to it, but he was soon made sensible of his error. His arm was suddenly seized by a large black hound, whose sharp fangs met in his flesh. Unable to repress a cry of pain, how slow to disengage himself from his assailant, and finding it impossible to bring himself to the water, in the hope of drowning him. But as the hound still maintained his 
hole. He searched for his knife to slay him, but he could not find it, and in his distress applied to Paslor. Hat ye on ye, we hung about your lord abbot, he cried, we which ye come free myself for this accursed hound. Alas, no, my son, replied Paslor, and I fear no weapon will prevail against it, for I recognize in the animal the hound of the wizard and die. A for to duel were in it, and rejoined Hal, or leave me to fight it out, and do you gain the pong and may to the best of your way to win so they and join ye or soon as a consush this one's head again the stone ha he added joyfully he found to whistle go go and soon be happier feeling he should sink if he remained where he was and wholly unable to offer any effectual assistance to his companion the abbot turned to the left where a large hole opened the stream and he was climbing the bank aided by the roots of the tree when a man suddenly came from behind it seized his hand and dragged him forcibly at the same moment his cat placed a bubble to his lips and winding a few notes he was instantly answered by a shout and soon afterwards half a dozen armed men ran up bearing torches not a word passed between the duty and his captor but when the men came up and the torch light fell upon features of the latter the abbot's worst fears were realised it was empty false to your king false to your law false to all men cried the wizard you see to escape in vain and merit all your reproaches by the abbot but it may be some satisfaction to you Learn that I have endured far greater suffering than if I had patiently awaited my doom. I am glad of it, rejoined the deed with a savage laugh. But you have destroyed what was beside yourself. Where is the bellow in the water? What for you will? But as no sound reached he snatched a torch from one of the heart busyers and held it to the river's bank. But he could see neither how no man. Strange, he cried, cannot have this game. Muriel is more than a match for any man. Secure the prisoner while I examine the stream. With this, he ran along the bank with great quickness holding his torch far over the water, so as to reveal anything was in the minute, but nothing met his view until he came within a short distance of the mill, when he beheld a black object struggling in the current, and soon found it was he saw making feeble efforts to gain the bank. Ah, recreant thou hast let him go, cried Ebony furiously, seeing his master the animal doubled his efforts, crept ashore, and fell at his feet with the last efforts of his hand. Then deep held down the torch, and then perceived that the hound was quite dead. There was a deep gash in his side, and in the world, showing how it perished. Poor Uriel he slain, the only true friend I had. Thou art gone, the villain has killed thee, but he shall pay for it with his life. And hurrying back, he dispatched four of the men in quest of the beauty, while accompanied by the two others, he conveyed Paslor back to the abbey, where he was placed in a strong cell from which there was no possibility of escape, and the guard set over him. Half an hour after this, two of the harpies returned with Halanabs, who they had succeeded in capturing at a desperate resistance. About a mile from the abbey on the road to Wiswall, he was taken to the guard room which had been appointed in one of the lower chambers of the chapter house, and Demdi was immediately appraised of his arrival. Satisfied by an inspection of a prisoner whose demeanour was sullen and resolved, Demdi proceeded to the great hall where the Earl of Derby, who had returned thither after the midnight mass, was still sitting with his shaders. An audience was readily obtained by the wizard, and apparently well pleased with the results of Returned to the guard room. The prisoner was seated by himself in one corner of the chamber, and his hands tied behind his back with a leather thong, and Demdi approached him, told him that for having aided the escape of the condemned rebel and traitor, and violently assaulted him between the streets in the execution of their duty, he would be hanged on the morrow of the Earl of Derby, who had power of life or death in such cases, having so wounded, and he exhibited the warrant so you mean to hang me, and was in fact Halanabs, kicking his heels with great power. I do, replied M.D. If for nothing else to slay my hound, I do not think it, replied how you alter your mind too, man. I'm not prepared to die just yet. Then perish in your sins, cried M.D. I will not give you an hour's respite. You'll be sorry when it's too late, said how Tush, said M.D. My only regret be that Muriel slaughter is paid for by such a worthless life as I. Then who take it, demanded how Especially when you lose your child by doing so. My child, exclaimed M.D. surprised. How mean you, Sarah, and 
mean this Clad how to live That if I do tomorrow morning Your child dies too When I undertook this job I calculated my chances And took cautions beforehand Your child's hostage for my safety Curses on thee and thy cunning Cried MD But I will not be outwitted by a hind like thee I will have the child And yet not be bolt of my revenge You never have it except as a breathless corpse About me consent and rejoin How we shall see Cried MD Rushing forth and bidding the guards look well to the prisoner But he long he returned with a gloomy and disappointing expression of countenance And again approaching the prisoner said Thou hast spoken the truth The infant is in the hands of some innocent being Over whom I have no power I told you so Wizard replied how laughing Point us a b I am a match for thee Ha ha Neo my life against the child Win your set me free Dim die deliberated Hark he wizard cried how If you're hatching treason I don't to sanctuary of revenge, win sweeten may last moments. Will you swear to deliver the child to me unharmed if I set you free? As MD, it's a bargain, wizard, rejoined Hal and Nabs. A swear, for you must set me free first, or I wanna talk your word. MD turned away disdainfully, and addressing the arpaziers said, You behold this warrant guard. Prisoner is committed to my custody. I will produce him on the morrow, or account for his absence to the Earl of Derby. One of the arpaziers examined the order, and vouching for the correct the others signified their assent to the arrangement upon which MD motioned the prisoner following and quitted the chamber. No interruption was offered to Hal's egress, so he stopped within the courtyard where Demdi awaited him and unfastened the leather thong that bound together his hand. Now go and bring the child to me, said the wizard. Nah, he's not bringing it to him myself, rejoined Hal. He knows better than know that. Be at the church porch in half an hour and advance the child be delivered to you safe and sound. And without waiting for a reply, he ran off with great swiftness. At the appointed time, Demdi saw church and as he drew Near it there issued from court female who hastily placing the child wrapped in a mantle in his arms tarried for no speech from him but instantly disappeared. MD, however, recognised in her the miller's daughter Dorothy Croft. Chapter 8 The Execution Dawn came at last after a long and weary night to many within and about the abbey. Everything betokened a dismal day. The atmosphere was damp and oppressive to the spirits, while the raw cold sensibly affected the rain. Surcharge with moisture, the royal banner on the gate drew some clung to the staff as if it to share in the general depression, or as if the sovereign authority it represented had given way. Countenances and the deportment of the men harmonised with the weather, they moved about gloomily and despondently, their bright countenances away to the wet and their pussing squads of mire. All on side was to watch a shivering sentinel on the walls, and yet more all on to see the groups of the abbots old tamers gathering without wrapping their blue woolen cloths, patiently enduring the drenched shores and awaiting the last awful scene. But the saddest sight of all was on the hill already described called the Hall Houses. Here two other lesser gibbers had been erected during the night, one on either hand of the loftier instrument justice, and the carpenters were yet employed in finishing their were, having been delayed by the badness of the weather, half drowned by the torrents that fell upon them. The poor fellows were technical in fear and with their disagreeable occasion by half a dozen well-mounted and well-armed troopers, and by as many held guardians, and this company completely exposed to the weather, suffered severely from wet and cold. The rain beat against the gallows, and ran down its whole naked horse, collected in pools at its feet. Even those within the abbey, and sheltered from the storm, shared at all, pervading despondency, the reflectory was old and comfortless, and the logs on the hearth hissed and sputtered and would not burn. Green wood had been brought instead of dry fuel by the drowsy henchmen. The viands on the board provoked not the petty, and the men emptied their cups of ale, yawned and stretched their arms, as if they would vain sleep an hour or two longer. The sense of discomfort was heightened by the entrance of those whose term of watch had been real and wide, who cast their dripping goats on the water, while two or three savage dogs streaming with moisture stretched their huge lamps for the sun fire and disused all the fortunate within the great hall were already gathered the retainers of the Earl of Derby, but the noble man himself had not appeared, having passed the great part of the night in conference with one person or another, and the abbot's flight having caused him much disquietude, though he did not hear of it till the future was recovered. The Earl would not seek his couch until within an hour of daybreak, and his attendants considering the state of the weather, and that it yet wanted full two hours to the time appointed for the execution, did not think it needful to disturb him. Braddle and Asherton, however, were up and ready 
there. Despite their firmness of nerve, they yielded like the rest of the depressing influence of the weather, and began to have some misgivings as to their own share in the tragedy about to be enacted. The various gentlemen in attendance paced to and fro within the hall, holding but slight converse together, anxiously counting the minutes for the time appeared to pass on without unwanted slowness, and ever and anon glancing through the diamond panes of the window at the rain pouring down steadily without and coming back again hopeless of amendment in the weather. If such were the disheartening influence of the day on those who had nothing to apprehend, what must its effect have been on the poor captives? Woeful indeed, two monks suffered a complete prostration of spirit. All the resolution which Father Haydock had displayed in his interview with the Earl of Derby failed him now, and he yielded to the agonies of despair. Father Eastgate was in little better condition, and gave vent to unavailing lamentations instead of paying heed to the consolatory discourse of the monks who had been permitted to visit him. The abbot was better sustained, though greatly enfeebled by the occurrences of the night, yet in proportion as his bodily strength decreased, his mental energies rallied. Since the confession of his secret offence, and the conviction he had obtained that his supposed victim still lived, a weight seemed taken from his breast, and he had no longer any dread of death. Rather, he looked to the speedy termination of existence with all pleasure. He prepared himself as decently as the means afforded him, permitted for his last appearance before the world, but refused all refreshment except water, and being left to himself was praying reverently, when a man who admitted into his cell, thinking it might be the executioner come to summon him, he arose, and to his surprise he held Hal and Nabs. The countenance of the rustic was pale, but his bearing was determined. You hear, my son, cried Peslow, I hoped you had escaped. I, I, the dog of fear, Abbot, replied Hal, and getting leave to visit you for a minute only, so I must be brief. Make yourself easy, you shall not eat me. On the bombs, how my son, cried Hasley, I understand you not have understood me. By and by, by our dinner being feared, one is seen in this. Comfort yourself that whoever is in the world, your death shall be avenged for your life. As the door of the world, and so in 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 the world, and so
future. What this man's aim was to have just offered himself and part the guests, but it have failed. And if your lordship will entrust the matter to me, I will answer that no further impediment shall arise, but that the sentence shall be fully carried out and the law satisfied. Your lordship can trust me, I know it, replied the earl, but it, as you will, it is now on the stroke nine. At ten, let all be in readiness to set out or with wall hall. The rain may have ceased by that time, but no weather must stay you. Go forth with a new executioner, sir, he added to the officer, and see all necessary preparations made. And as Dendy bowed and departed with the officer, the earl sat down with his retainers to break his fast.